Hello and welcome to our ACCE Learning Network Hangout. It's a place where we can connect with our PLN to share practice, ideas and have a good old chinwag. It's a moment to network with friends across the world. And Jason, welcome and thank you for taking over from Amanda. As per usual, if you're watching us live, then you can post a question to the panel and just go to http todaysmeet.com slash A-C-C-E-L-N and on Twitter using the A-C-C-E-L-N hashtag. This is Hangout number 28 for 2013. I am Roland Guesthausen. I'm a high school teacher, e-learning leader in Victoria, Australia, and I'm also a state councillor on the ICT in Education Victoria, which will soon be renamed the DLT Vic, Digital Learning and Teaching Victoria. I'm excited by tonight's show as a fellow space geek and a fan of the work by all the different space nuts that I admire. <laughs> I've also been busy this week pointing out things at our space camp. Um, we had a, um, it wasn't really a space camp, it was a scout camp and I was busy pointing out satellites and planets and there's an app that helps with that. And, uh, and I'm, I'll, I'm, I'll introduce uh, Jason. Jason. And I'm Jason Zagami filling in for Amanda who's um, a little bit ill tonight. And I'm a lecturer at Griffith University and also been very involved in science and space education over many years. And back to Roland. Thank you. Now tonight um, we've got uh, a couple of guests and I'll get them introduced themselves from uh, left to right. There's a uh, guest for tonight, Peter. G'day Roland, how are you? So, uh, currently fellow Victorian, but I, I used to be up in Queensland uh, about 15 years ago. <laughs> so, I was born up there, moved down to Victoria in the year 2000. So, uh, I'm a service and support manager in the IT industry, work for one of the big uh, corporates. Uh, I also um, have a telescope that um, is um, part of my passion in astronomy, and uh, that's affiliated with itelescope.net through a community of users. So. Um, I own the telescope and share it out with the group um, to some sort of subscriber paying members and uh, we get a lot of great science done and I've been doing a lot of work in education uh, with high schools over the last um, 12 months or so um, just in my spare time and uh, I've got three teenage kids at, uh, at a high school here in Victoria and we've been doing a little bit of work with them so we'll be discussing that a bit tonight and and how to, you know, I guess what I've heard from you guys over the last couple of months is uh, the flat classroom and getting out of the way of your students and allowing them to embrace the technology and learn. So I'll be sharing how maybe I've put in a couple of um, those things to practice over the last couple of months. So not that I'm a classroom teacher, but I'm a parent helper at a local school, so <laughs> with a telescope. So. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. And you've been with us actually since uh, Karaki, our early days when we were setting up the uh, ACCL Learning yes. Network. So it's great to have you on board, this time on the hot seat as a guest. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and Ziad, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Ziad Barudi. I'm an IT and maths teacher at, a, uh, uh, at an all-girls um, secondary college. I really don't know a lot about astronomy, but like a lot of people... I suppose I'm always fascinated to hear uh, stuff about it, so I'll probably be muting my microphone as soon as this intro finishes and just <laughs> listening for the rest of the night. Um, I'm sure you think of some interesting questions. Um, now, we're here tonight to discuss space, and there's lots of it. I mean, more than you can imagine. This sounds like an opening for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Jason. <laughs> and <laughs> I know... Um, I'd like to perhaps ask you um, to introduce uh, Peter and ask him the first question. So, Peter, you've been involved in astronomy and amateur astronomy and, and a variable star observer, and recently you've been working with students and classroom teachers. Can you tell us how science teachers can get their kids involved in real science projects? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and perhaps I might just, set, um, just spend two or three minutes just painting a bit of a picture for you of what's happening. Um, so astronomy today um, involves a lot of uh, citizen science. So I'm not sure if you can see this. Um, this is a slide I've put together, so it's part of my my model of understanding of, of this space. And um, 
astronomy is, is an interesting thing because it captures people's imagination and passion. And uh, at the age of 15, I lay in the backyard. As a 15-year-old boy, I was the lonely person in the backyard <laughs> counting meteors at 1 o'clock in the morning in my sleeping bag. So uh, astronomy 1.0, if you like, um, was a long time ago now. Um, and you know, it's still valid today, still a lot of this happens, but it, it's observation at the eyepiece or it's recording of raw data in, in observations. And um, as a 15-year-old boy, there's no one I could tell. There was, there was nothing I could do. Um, uh, the, you know, the astronomers didn't want to know there was a 15-year-old boy counting meteors in the backyard at 1 o'clock in the morning, and there was no internet, there was no way of sharing data. Um, John O'Sullivan at the CSIRO, um, in 1998 was working on how to separate noise out in, in radio channels of his antenna and came up with what eventually led to the codec that uh, became the wireless internet codec today. Um, so as we moved from, from astronomy being at the eyepiece or on a very lonely mountain somewhere, we now have in astronomy 2.0, we have um, space telescopes, we've got Hubble images being shared across the internet, we've got torrents of data being um, spread around, we've got leftover data from missions that the astronomers really don't know what to do with or they can't get to it because there's so much data. Um, and about this time, in the early stages of the internet, I'm sure Roland would have done this, I, I, I bet that he, he would have thought, mm, you know, that there was two guys at um, um, MIT, I think it was, um, and, and they said, well, you've got these computers and the screens going funny. We need these screensavers. And I know, I know, what a good idea if we could get a screensaver to actually do something like search for extra terrestrial intelligence. So the very first citizen science project was born. Uh, where you could download a piece of code and process some signals on your PC and the data would go back um, to the scientists who would then, so it's been categorized or flagged for a point of interest. So in astronomy 2.0, we've got, um, you know, the internet starting to get involved, people starting to engage with science. And now what I call 3.0, the virtual star parties and the hangouts like what we're doing tonight, we've got leftover data, we've got communities of interest, we've got pervasive social media, um, and we also now have telescopes in the cloud where telescopes like mine you can log into from a classroom in Australia in broad daylight onto a, tech, uh, a telescope in New Mexico where it's midnight and take photos of asteroids for you know, a science mission. So what we've seen, and this is a very brief summary on this, I usually spend about 20 minutes on this, but um, this very brief summary of how astronomy has changed. All these things and parts of it are still valid today, but in a, there are different things coming to the fore now, and a lot of data that um, that's left over from missions that can be processed by the crowd. So within that context, we now have schools getting involved in citizen science projects. So um, things like um, Zooniverse is one good one where there's a number of um, citizen science projects uh, where you, they go in a broad range of things from going through old shipping logs and um, uh, manually entering data for the temperature records out of the shipping logs mm, as a proxy, that's the old, you know, in the old weather projects. That's, yeah, yeah, that was that was so, fascinating, and I never got above becoming a cleaner because you'd sort of rise the ranks of the ships as you uh, begin to enter yeah. more data, eventually reaching captain. Um, I, <laughs> I mean, well, I think I was still a cleaner, you know, but, but it was yeah, fascinating yeah. for me because I began to realise um, how how um, these guys were not just pioneers and charting the ocean for the first time, but mm. taking the first weather records in these specific locations and adding to a climate data yeah. pool. So, so one of the, the aspects to this is it's the gamification, if I could use that word, of the boring data collection. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of has a, that role-playing game, as you, as you described. There's really interesting things like, you know, measuring, I think there was some ice ones, um, at CosmoQuest.org, we've got um, 
Dr. Pamela Gay, who's a very famous social media astronomer, and she's got a lot of um, uh, data there from missions around the Vesta probe that went to the asteroid Vesta, um, Mercury, and Moon Mapper. So uh, her students, um, and many of them are students, uh, are measuring um, like the size of craters, and they get a little um, put there. Um, mouse and they measure the crater and put a ring around it and then the ones that are on top of other craters are all, uh, sorry, younger craters than the bigger ones that are underneath. So they're getting an age map of the craters on the moon as well as very precise um, measurements. And the, the professional astronomers when they engage the crowd in this manner, what they're looking for is to firstly get through truckloads of data that's going to tie up time on supercomputers uh, secondly, um, they can have less precise data so long as there's more of it and comparing between different users. So they'll average the results together uh, and still come out with valid information. So um, within the classroom, there's a number of these kind of things. Uh, Cosmic Quest is just a, a web page you can join and you can pull up the app and, and measure craters. Uh, and that that is something you could do as a state breaker, as a science teacher, just for a task, you know, just between different activities in the classroom. Uh, but there are other things you can do as well. Um, one of the ones I'm working on at the moment is probably a fairly advanced project, and I'm deliberately doing it with students to see, firstly, how much I can get away with. <laughs> um, so that's that's Zooniverse, Z-O-O-N-I-V-E-R-S-E. -E. Just uh, thanks, Zad, for the question there. Um, Z-O-O-N-I-V-E-R-S-E. -E. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, so what I'm doing is deliberately pushing the boundaries here. You know, I've sat in this forum, like many of you listening tonight have, and I've heard things like, don't stand in the way of your students' learning get out of the way and let them use the technology and show you how much they can come up with. <laughs> and, and as I said, while I'm not a classroom teacher, I'm in there as a teacher helper uh, with an area of expertise. Uh, and we're kind of tag teaming it with a very capable uh, teacher. Um, we are genuinely pushing the boundaries. And so rather than me spending three hours teaching the class about what the right ascension declination coordinate system is, what ephemeris tool is, what the minor planet center role does in modern astronomy. We split up into five groups and said, pull out your iPads, you go answer this three questions. Like what is what is the role of the minor planet center and how do they help professional amateur astronomers work together? Mm -hmm. So that was a question from the group. And then they went and researched that for half an hour and came and presented back to the class. So I sort of scattered around the room and, and just made sure they're all on task. Um, another one, you know, how to use an ephemeris tool to work out where to point a telescope at a target. Uh, so that was another one, and the group did a presentation back. Um, and in the next couple of days, you're going to see that one of the most staggering videos on the NASA website that it's just blown me away, where the... Um, how we got to do this was um, we were working with Arizona University on a project called Target Asteroids. Mm -hmm. So um, OSIRIS-REx is a um, sample return mission that's going to go to a particular asteroid and bring a 60 gram sample back. But astronomers wanted to, or, or the mission controllers wanted to engage the amateur astronomers Again, as I said, get less precise but a lot more data on the albedo of asteroids, i.e. the brightness and reflectivity of them, for those not familiar with the term, as they come past Earth and how that changes depending on the phase angle. So if it's coming in from this side and it's going out from that side, the the curve as it goes past, how the, the brightness and reflection of that asteroid changes. So that helps them understand a lot about what the asteroid's made up of. So um, we're invited, I was working on this project through iTelescope, and I've been doing a lot of research myself. And we thought we'd try it on with the students and just see what their take on it would be. And they absolutely loved it. 
And yes, it's scary to do something that advanced with, um, you know, a year eight and nine level, but um, they have embraced it and really gone after the learning and really feel quite excited about what they've been a part of the last two sessions that we've done. So in the process of that, the Juno spacecraft was due to fly past Earth on the way to on the way to take some very nice photos of Jupiter in 2016. Um, and part of the process of what we've been doing was learning how to point a telescope at a target, which is what the ephemeris tool tells us to do. And this is the, uh, as you remember, the NASA, you know, a lot of their staff were down due to the government shutdown. Um, mm -hmm. And they asked the Osiris Rex target asteroids community, could we help out with um, with um, getting some photos of Juno as it flew past, doing a slingshot acceleration past Earth on its way to Jupiter. And uh, here is what they came up with. So on their iPads, they were able to log on to NASA JPL website, and they were able to get the correct position. And that night, my daughter loaded up the telescope with me, and uh, we pointed it at, at their target, not mine. And they got it right. And it was, it was so good to see kids in five different groups with their iPads all working on the same tool and then running to the glass to write up their target coordinates to compare their data with each other to see if they were right. <laughs> That's fantastic. Can you, can you zoom out there just to point out the, um, the flyby yeah. there? So you can see it coming through here. I think I just stopped. Where are we here? Um, I'll just hit the play button again. Sorry. Play. So you can actually see it moving through the field here. Um, you see it just up, just above the center here, the little streak moving across. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the Juno spacecraft doing a slingshot around Earth. So by the time it came out of the Earth's shadow to when it was too faint to be photographed, it was about nine hours in total. So we th they did very, very <laughs> well to get that and uh, very excited, I'll tell you what, there's one excited principal at the school. Peter, it reminds me when um, oh, many years ago, I'm giving my age away here, um, I read it in the uh, local newspaper that the um, Skylab was doing a last flyover Melbourne before it was going to swing around the world and then disintegrate <laughs> back on Australia and uh, um, I was really lucky to be able to sit down and sort of poke a glimpse through the clouds to see this um, mm. bright light streaking through the sky. And that was a big thing at that time. Um, yeah. And I, I guess now what you've done is you've been able to sort of bridge it in with the kids and they begin to start, they begin to see mm. things perhaps a bit differently, don't they? With um, the heavens aren't just this empty void, um, places where people can yes. live, work and study. Yeah, and, and they're, they're finding it, um, it's been really interesting for them to um, to target. I'll just show you one more image here. Uh, this is one of an asteroid that we photographed and we reported the position. Um, so you can see here in the blue uh, where the blue crosshairs are here. I'll just mm -hmm. sorry, get this. See here in the blue crosshairs? Yep. Um, you can see the little dot there. That's the asteroid. Um, and this it is a stack of 15 images um, stacked for the movement of the asteroids. So the background stars are actually streamed here. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get a position of the known position of the reference stars and then where the asteroid is. And this is what we call astrometry, so the position of moving objects. So they've been having some pretty... Uh, uh, and, you know, I've been surprised at just how effectively they can be given a task and go away and use their research tools today to come back with some really quite well-constructed answers to those questions. Mm. And then uh, it's about the fluency of understanding what it is that they're doing. So we went through the basic concepts um, of, well, where do you point your telescope? Why is it important to know where your telescope is on the face of the Earth? because um, depending on where you are on the Earth, um, these tools that tell you where targets are have to be referenced to where you are. So you need your latitude and longitude and observatory code. And one of the questions was, what is an observatory code for? 
And one of the kids came up with this this um, beautiful example. It was like a name tag for observatories. <laughs> you know, and, and I thought it was it was such a simple concept. You know, um, that an observatory code. So an observatory code is like my telescope's at H06, and that H06 tells the Minor Planet Center that its latitude, longitude, its altitude above the Earth, so that when they are creating target lists for, you can put in, you don't have to type in the latitude and longitude and the altitude every time, you can just type in your observatory code, um, and it helps them separate out my data from someone else, right? So, and, and these kids come up with this fantastic concept well, the observatory code's like a name tag for your observatory. And I'd never thought of it like that before, but it was such a beautiful description. So you can see um, this was the asteroid, and we reported this into the uh, Target Asteroids mission. So um, you had a question there, Roland. Um, yeah, so the do question I'm thinking of is question? about data and terminology, because yeah. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of words that astronomers throw around, like latitude and azimuth and elevation. And I, and I wonder, you've obviously got a way of being able to tell it to people without scaring them off. Um, I mean, we, we tend to throw away those terms when I'm talking about mm. um, the periodic table, um, atomic mass, mm. um, atom radius. And, and I wonder, how do you introduce these ideas in astronomy in a way that builds up a love of astronomy without scaring them off the technology or, or just making that bar so high that um, the kids don't mm. connect with it? Yeah, and, and it's, I, th I really think it's a balancing act between, um, like, not everyone can probably do what I've done, mm -hmm. but what I'm trying to show to classroom teachers that I encounter is that, you know, well, it might not always be about their science or the astronomy, but you can take uh, a teacher of the deaf and bring in a cochlear expert and talk about, you know, that sort of technology, or you could have a reading club and bring in a famous author and put that author in front of the class and have a discussion around writing techniques. Or, so I think that the power is in the technology and the platform, what it brings into the classroom, and I'm deliberately pushing the boundaries just to see how this space works. Um, because you know, with with eye telescope, I work with with a number of high schools. I've got one in Marinskaya, in the Ukraine, and there's a PhD astronomy student, who's I think also a ballerina, um, in the Ukraine, and amazingly energetic young lady, who just mentors the class. And the class, I mean, this class are driving her. She's not driving them. <laughs> that. And this, this was a real lump in the throat moment for me. There's a guy called Maxim at Marinskaya High School in Ukraine. And you know, he, he applied for a grant and we granted him some time on the telescopes. And he's discovered seven new variable stars as part of him. He and another girl who's working with him in the school. It's just a very small group. They've discovered seven new variable stars, a pulsating one, a uh, couple of eclipsing binaries, and one one or two that are actually quite interesting and need a bit more study. And, and you know, Roland, I had a lump in my throat when I heard the story behind it was that he's applying for a university in Ukraine next year and he wants to improve the quality of his resume to make sure it gets into a good university. And he's discovered seven variable stars as an 18-year-old. Now, I've had two conversations with this mentor, <laughs> so it's out of control. I can't stop it. It's just going off, all right? So, so yes, there's, you know, I mean, there, there's two ways of looking at this. The science teacher might look at me and go, oh, my God, why the hell are they letting him near my class, <laughs> right? But, you know, but, hey, let, let's, let's step back and, and look at the big picture and say, you know, there are people out there in every school who have skills who could come into your classes and help you, you know, through be it a parent helper or a, or a local community where, you know, you can go through the process and getting your child safe um, certificate and all that sort of stuff and going through the proper channels and, and all that. But um, it's just been great and the kids are responding to this like you wouldn't believe. They... They're really enjoying it. 
I'm getting text messages at night from parents like, what the hell did you do with my kids today? They can't stop talking about it. Oh, that's <laughs> so, wonderful. And that, and that, and that know, speaks really it, well for the way that you It's been quite prepared. exciting. Hmm. You, you know what? The, the debate's been around for a long time. You know, I, I'm sure that when Galileo um, sort of um, showed the first bunch of um, priests, generals, his um, moons around Jupiter with his telescope there, I'm, I'm sure when they stepped away there, I mean, they would have said, you know, is this guy for real? Look at it. Hmm. And besides, where does it fit in? I mean, is it is it optics? I mean, I mean, the astrologers are going to have hell if they're going to try and have to cope with this stuff as well. Um, mm. We don't have this discipline, and I'm sure mm. that in some ways, um, charting these new areas are going to be interesting for science teachers because um, astronomy hasn't rated highly in the, the curriculum. Um, it's not right. seen as relevant for some people because, well, that, that kind of stuff is out there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what I'm really sort of pushing the boundaries for quite deliberately is try, trying to look for a pathway here because, um, you know, we've got the square corner array coming in in Australia. Um, the kids who are going to work on that sort of aren't even in high school yet. Um, it's going to answer some of the fundamental questions of the universe and it, it's amazing that the square kilometre array in Western Australia, for those who don't know, is going to record in the first 24 hours, more data than the first 50 years of radio and television combined. Mm. Right? And just... uh, it, this is mind-boggling, right? So what, what it does is it takes a three gigabyte block of data and it has a, like a radio image in one by frequency in the other and by spectra in, in that way. And, mm. the, and it's going to be live sequenced at and some of the antenna arrays that I've seen are going to have like, I think, 92 terabits coming off the back of, of the collection of arrays. So, um, 92 terabits a second. <laughs> it's just. It's just forget about astronomers. They love big numbers, don't they? That they do. They do. Uh, but it it doesn't stop there. I mean, you look at the emerging middle class in India. India this week, you can see, has its own space program, right? China want to go to the moon, <laughs> uh, so you know that there's there's excitement around this stuff. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to do is say, well, if you want to create a pipeline for improved outcomes in maths and science and, and you know, astronomy at the university level, you have to capture the hearts and minds of the the nine, uh, the year nine level. Um, and then once we get them through like a curriculum enrichment program in high school, then you can do the kind of stuff I'm doing with them now with target asteroids. And then once they go through that and they understand, then there's a whole new program beyond that run by a group which I can probably put in the show notes. Um, I think it's the IASC um, where they get images from telescopes and give them to schools to, to look for asteroids. And I think something like 38 new asteroids have been discovered this year by school students. And then what, that's a, um, a program that runs for about six months. And then after that finishes, they say, well, you've got all the skills, go knock yourself out. And then those people kind of come back onto our telescopes at iTelescope and then do their own work. Um, and, you know, this only this week I've been tracking an asteroid mm -hmm. uh, which has, uh, you know, got a rating one on the Torino scale at the moment, which means that potentially there's a virtual impact there some time down the track. So um, we'll probably remove that off the risk table within the month, but um, that's being watched closely by people who are amateur astronomers who have the skills to do that sort of stuff. Peter, um, so when I'm I was in the States... on my sackbox, so I'll let you ask some questions. <laughs> yeah, when I was in the States, there was a, um, an observatory, um, not Matt Wilson, um, Oh, bother. No, it's just left me. And I remember that the chap who built it was really keen for the general population to stand behind a telescope and have a look. And he thought it was such an awe-opening, inspiring experience. Um, perhaps, you know, the process of belittling someone or, or seeing the grandeur of the universe that um, it sort of put into perspective all of the problems that um, people are squabbling over here. Um, do you find that that's enough, that um, just simply you know, sticking your nose in the end of a telescope is enough of an engagement that someone needs to have? Or do you want to take them that step further, being able to look at mm. becoming part of a, the community of scientists collecting data or um, making measurements of asteroids? 
Yeah, and it's a really good question. I, I guess I started out um, working, you know, at the school my kids go to, just taking a small telescope in and setting it up in the class and helping the kids understand, you know, uh, the difference between an equatorial mount and a, and a um, you know, an uh, alt azimuth mount. Um, that, and, that was, and we had then an observation session a couple of nights later. And, you know, the kids loved that. And the, the aha moment when they look into the telescope and then they come back and look up and go, no, no, that's not right. And they look again and they look and they look. Um, when they see the rings of Saturn or Ju the moons of Jupiter for the first time, you know, it, it is something. And I think what the emotion of astronomy is is that um, and I look at it like this, you know, it's out there, we can't touch it, we can't pollute it, we can't mess it up. <laughs> it's kind of unreachable and all we can do is look at it and measure it and photograph it. And, uh, uh, you know, if you think of it like that, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we can walk through the local gorge in our national park, but, you know, we can touch that and we can muck it up and do that. W with astronomy, it's kind of the untouchable, unreachable um, last frontier, but we can watch it and measure it and and be in awe of it. And I, I think that's that's where I get my passion for from. I guess to be part so of something Peter, bigger. Hmm. Hmm. So, so Peter, how how do you go about getting um, teachers and then their students involved in um, these sort of projects? Yeah. Well, you know, I guess. Um, the school that I'm working with at the moment here locally um, is quite passionate. Um, um, you know, they have uh, an extension program for the kids, and, and this is part of that program. Uh, that you know, that there's science teachers in schools who who are passionate people. Sometimes, I mean, one of the other teachers that I've worked with previously had their own telescope. I mean, there's a school, another private school just down the road from us that's got their own little dome and telescope and observatory, and there's a science teacher there who's very passionate about astronomy as well. And so I think, um, you know, w where do you start? And, you know, I, I kind of say, well, look, and I'm always very clear with the classroom teacher that, hey, I'm not a qualified teacher. I'm not here to tell you how to teach. I mean, you, you are the best of the best. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be allowed to be <laughs> working with you and I just encourage them that you know that technology is changing there's a lot of things you can bring into the classroom now and you know wouldn't something like this you know look good in your resume in terms of you um, you know bringing in some new thinking into your school and I'm always very wary uh, not to make try and not make it look too scary for them because I'm married to a teacher I know how hard they work and you know, when some bright spark comes in with a great new idea, sometimes it looks like more work and uh, how can I fit that in with all my marking and all my other workloads? And, uh, it, you know, it's about running with them at the pace that they want to run without being a burden on them or holding them back but just, just putting the next step for them out in front of them and running at the pace they want to go. And, like, I've, I've got teachers... Um, uh, there's one at um, in Papignon, France, where where they also did some variable star astronomy, and uh, you know the kids there are amazing. Every time they sent me a question, they'd already found the answer to it themselves by the time I got back to them. <laughs> so, so that they were quite incredible to uh, to work with. So, hmm. and uh, Zia, do you want to ask the next question? Sure, why not? Uh, you mentioned something about a private school that has um, its own observatory or something like that. Um, but at the same time, you're talking about a lot of things that people can do on their computers. So well, where is a good starting point as far as equipment is concerned for a school that's interested? Yeah, well, I mean, there's nothing worse than spending $60,000 on a telescope and a dome and mm -hmm. um, setting it all up and having people pouring all over it. It's shiny and looks great. and and then a teacher gets transferred out of the school and no one else knows how to run it. Um, not, not that that would happen, but I'm just saying, you know, it, it's potentially there. But I, I think there's a good approach in that, in having the hands-on and the, um, 
you know, the the wow factor of being able to, you know, operate it yourself and, you know, learn the basic techniques and, and having a good leader within the school who can champion that is, is a great thing and I wouldn't knock it for a minute. Um, but not every school has the resources to do that, right? So they don't they may not they might have someone who's, you know, a champion equestrian show jumper on the teaching staff and that might be their passion, but then they're not into this science or something like that. So it, it depends on the, the interest level, I guess, within the school that you have and what you can tap into from the parent community. So one of the things, um, you know, Yara here, we, we, we've got a, a parent spirit community where the parents can set up different groups for the school. So there's one for equestrian, there's one for tennis, there's one for music. Um, I'm hoping to begin to start one for science so that you can support the classroom teachers with the capabilities to actually you know, tease tease out the boundaries a little bit here. Um, yeah. The other answer to your question is that there's a lot of resources online. So for a teacher that you know doesn't know a lot about astronomy, you still got Cosmic Quest and Zooniverse and some of those online um, ca data categorization tools that you can use just as a little um, you know state play game within your science class just to break up the flow a bit but you can easily take one little unit of that like measuring craters on the moon and stick it into your science thing when you're studying the moon um, sure. th th but you'll also find that as you reach out into the Cosmo Quest has a lot of curriculum development activities um, where they're starting to put curriculum on line for teachers they're starting to run courses to help teachers understand uh, what they can do, and and a simple one is is um, uh, they do the, the the crater measurements with with the tool, but they also get um, I think it's flour and cocoa. You've probably done this, Roland, and and drop marbles yeah. into it and watch the craters actually happen and how they oh, age oh. over the period of a week. You know when there's little vibrations in the classroom and stuff like that, or or they blow on it with wind. Um, and see how those craters change. So, so these are things that are available on Cosmic Quest, and some of NASA's got a very good education curriculum library. Um, so, you know, as I said before, I'm deliberately pushing the boundaries to see how far we can take this. Um, but I'm always cognizant of the fact that there are simple steps that every teacher can do to get, um, you know, their toe in the water. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm actually, yes. when you see me dropping my head, it's because I'm actually uh, taking some notes which I was sent to a, uh, a science teacher friend of mine who I think would have been fascinated by that. Unfortunately, it's our um, college's graduation yeah. night tonight, though, so most of my uh, colleagues... Well, they can always watch a replay tomorrow night on Roland's website. So it's a sure, yeah, absolutely. Champion. I remember um, we, we had a telescope that was only ever used to look at ants on the other side of the football oval. Um, <laughs> it was a pity that um, because of the Gippsland fires, we lost our school <coughs> camp in the fires, and the telescope went. Um, we then were left with um, just the posters that were sort of dating post Apollo and the um, early um, science projects. What's interesting though is that we they had a Galileo project, and we built our own little telescope, and mm. there were some really good questions from the kids. They were stunned that the picture was upside down and uh, how he'd managed to conduct all this astronomy, you know, flipping it around in his mind and uh, then about the idea of um, making that simple observation of the changing shape of Venus into a crescent and to realizing about Earth's place in space and then um, the moons of Jupiter realizing there may be other planetary bodies and so um, Taking along on that journey was really powerful. So we did that in the classroom with nothing more than some mm. simple tools and mm. um, optical instruments and um, asking questions. We did go from that though. Um, we had the chance to put together some of the ideas that we had into a dance. Um, and I had a wonderful uh, friend called Ross Burner from the uh, cosmology division um, send us some notes. The kids thought the funniest one was that one of the questions they sent him was, uh, what's the universe made of? And he indicated it was really made of um, just one element, hydrogen, with some minor contaminants. <laughs> mm. And I think that um, 
for us it was really powerful to be able to um, conduct um, those questions and to do it in a way that um, explores it. But I guess I'm lucky. I, I have that kind of passion and enthusiasm, Peter. Um, mm. we, we all have those lucky breaks when uh, we get uh, someone who can give us a chance and a leg up into that sort of um, thinking of the universe. Um, Jason, um, you've had some experience of NASA too, haven't you? Um, yes, over many years I taught um, space education. I was lucky enough to teach in a private school where we could actually create our own units. So I created a couple of units on space education and on robotics and a few others. But I was um, selected to go to a um, one of the biannual, or semi-annual, um, astronomy conferences where all the astronomers from all around the world gathered together. And this time it was on Hamilton Island. And they chose six Australian and six US teachers to go along. And we got to spend two weeks there with all the astronomers. And in particular with um, Jill Tata, who was in contact, and um, Alan Drake, who did the Drake equation for working out the potential for life to be detected on other planets. And we oh. spent quite a long time with the guys from NASA looking at all the resources they had and trying to come up with programs that could be implemented in schools. And since then, I got involved in uh, polishing up mirrors and having the students polish up mirrors and put them on these globes that they dropped from various space um, launches to measure the their um, tracking as they re-entered the atmosphere. And we also created, um, built some radio telescopes for the Radio Jove project, which I see is still going, um, where they can set up these radio telescopes. And because Jupiter emits quite a lot of um, radio waves, um, it's a fairly easy target to be able to measure and then collect all that data and send it back to NASA and be part of those projects. So there's lots of... The, the one good thing about NASA is they have to spend a percentage of every space mission on educational outreach. And since their space missions are often have budgets in the billions, that means they have almost every single mission has a, has a million dollars or so that they're spending on outreach programs for students. And so there's mm. lots and lots of resources that they, they produce for that. Mm. So one of the challenges training. at the moment, I think, is with the, in the sequestration, a lot of those education budgets are being collected up into a single pile, and I'm not sure that uh, there's a lot of um, discussion at the moment about... <laughs> how effective the, the proposals are for where that's going to head in the next couple of years, I think. So this is a few years. They have had cutbacks. Um, yeah. But at the moment, it's still legislated that they have to spend that percentage mm. on educational outreach. So until they change that, um, that money will still be being yeah. allocated. Even though it's a smaller pie, there's still an mm. amount being allocated for education. Hmm. I think there's a good lesson for Australia that when we have these major initiatives that we think about how to just invest it back into a younger generation. Um, what do you reckon, Peter? When we're not just talking about the um, uh, you know the, the the construction of a large network or a, um, resource that you actually put aside something for schools so it doesn't get trimmed out and um, and then yeah. left up to a, a few scientists to cobble together a display. Um, out of uh, polystyrene to f explain the gaps. <laughs> um, I had um, a wonderful trip back from um, Queensland um, and I had a chance to do some space science. Now, mine don't look anything like yours and I don't have any computers or graphics. I just had my old clappy art camera. But mm. I wonder if I could share that if it's all right here. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, I'd like some honest feedback here. So um, I've got here my professional astronomer. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, these are with my, my kids here. So um, I'll just get the screen share going here. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So here's my um, first picture here. And uh, this is um, one I took with uh, Sil Kieran's, a good friend of mine in, um, in Brisbane. And can you make out the constellation there? Yep, is that Scorpio heading to the horizon? Yeah, that's Scorpio there. With Venus, yeah, that's, Venus. That's in, right. uh, Venus is a bright one, yeah, because that would have been taken only a few days ago, I would suspect. Thank you, that's right. And uh, um, <laughs> I just... I, just I know because I know where Venus is, like, this week. So, <laughs> ah, awesome. so I was looking at it now, last week. The question is, are the colours real, or the an artefact of the camera, or...? Um... Yeah, no, no, the colours are quite real. So um, just near... 
Um, the one up from Venus, I think, there is probably uh, Antares, which has got a, quite a red colour. Yep. That's a very bright red. And then some of the ones in the, yellow, in the tail are a little bit yellow and blue. So, yeah, no, that's, that's a good image. Um, you probably Thank find you. if you open it up in one of the photo editing and just adjust the levels a little bit, you can, might bring a little bit more out of that. Yeah, I have to try and get some of that background noise out. Um, that was yeah, like, that, that was just before the battery died in the camera. I, I'd taken so many yeah. photos at the QSight conference, there was barely any juice left in my camera for astrophotography. But I managed yeah. to get that one out of the way. Um, and then on the drive home, we passed this thing by the road. And you might have seen mm. it before. That's oh, the, yes, yes, the um, uh, space drive. Yeah, the space trial, and that was fun. There's, there's some geocaches, yeah. I think, hidden behind that tree there. Um, yeah. And um, it was a great way to actually drive along a highway and realize how empty space is. I mean, this looks big, but we'd been driving for a good, I think, um, hour um, away from the large one that represented the sun. Yeah, so for those unfamiliar with it, it's, um, I think, the tourism marketing in Coonabarabran. Um, mm. Uh, placed up and down the Newell Highway at proportional distances between the planets where the Sun is actually at the um, Siding Springs Observatory. Um, Earth is about halfway down the hill um, and in town I think is Saturn, uh, oh no, no, um, is J Mars I think, and yeah. then Jupiter is just outside of town. And I think then the junction to the Oxley Highway is where Saturn is Mm. And Uranus, and I think Neptune's at Bagatta, just almost on the Queensland border, just south of Moree. Uh, actually, no, that might be Pluto when it was still a planet, because <laughs> it was real <laughs> when Pluto was still a planet. And um, my kids were most upset. Still got it. It was, yeah, the kids were most upset. In the, the fine print, it qualifies a planet. Dwarf yeah. planet now. And this is probably <laughs> one of my dwarf, better ones. This, if you uh, stop your car. Yeah. And here we go. There's one of my better ones here, and that's from the. Uh, Okay. Um, I, I backed off a little bit on the um, exposure, and this is out in Outback Australia. And I recommend anyone who goes out into Outback Australia get your cameras out and have a go at it. Um, I was wrapped at the colours and the space lanes that you can actually start to see the mm. dust lanes there. And uh, it took can a lot of photos. Can you just share that to the big screen, settings. Roland? Because it's not yep. coming up on the. Okay. Coming up on the big screen. There we go. Um, that's the top uh, of the um, Saturn there. Uh, just check again. Mine Peter, if you off. click on this thumbnail, it'll stay there for you. Yeah, there we go. Doing, ah, there we go. Got it. There we go. Okay. So you can actually see the, some of the dust lanes there. Yeah, that's um, great. Yeah. And, and that, was, that was good fun. And it didn't take too many photos once I got the hang of my camera settings. Um, yeah. Just varying things and um, playing around with it. And, there again, you can see the, the hook of the um, Scorpio. And it was just fun. And for my kids to sit down at, the, um, at night and look up, um, that to me, I guess, was the, um, you know, the lesson for my children. Yeah. Um, away from the big city lights, you can see a hell of a lot more. Just maybe take the trouble to um, look up. Mm. And, yeah, and, and people don't realise until they go to a dark sky site and really, um, you know, have a look at... Um, uh, what, what a real dark sky, Siding Springs is amazing, amazing up there. You go up to Siding Spring and it's just, um, you know, if you're outside at night with um, when there's no moon, you, you literally can't see your hand in front of your face. It's that dark. It's, um, it's quite amazing and to see the Milky Way just like, across the galaxy, across the sky like that is, is quite amazing. Now, um, you, there's no bushfires. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just... Yeah. Um, you hinted, Peter, that um, citizen science astronomy projects are really worth getting engaged in. And do you want to list some of your favourite ones where people could start if they were involved? Um, ways of connecting yeah, so, with this kind of big science. Um, so yeah, I think the easy ones to start with would be a cosmoquest.org. That's c o s m o q u e s t. dot org. Um, so that one. Is um, I might just um, try and pull it up in the browser here and share it with you um, and just show you what it looks like. Chris, oh, can't type straight. Um, and that's run by Dr. Pamela Gay. She's got a, a very strong following, and uh, she's got um, Dr. Nicole Gallucci working with her, and that's. Uh, 
hosted at the Southern Illinois University Edwardsville um, and it's uh, got a very strong um, I'll just share that for you a very strong um, um, there you go so if you're watching this later you can uh, you can get that so it's got the moon mapper the Vesta mappers the Mercury mappers um, and it's great they have um, some curriculum tools there for science teachers and it's a very strong leader in the STEM curriculum in the United States and a great community, good forums, they run hangouts on area every week. Um, some of them are, are specifically orientated towards education and learning, uh, which is good. Um, so the, the one I'm currently working on is on um, this one here, which I'll just get up for you. Um, and it's called Osiris Rex Target Asteroids. So this one's probably a little bit more advanced and you'd w want a little bit of pre-knowledge. But, you know, there, there are pathways. You know, at the end of the day, you know, 14-year-old kids can type logins into text boxes, you know, and they can look up web pages and they can research stuff and learn how to get things done. So um, this is this one here. So... Uh, what we're doing uh, here is we're actually um, measuring, you've got my photo there with my telescope, so for those of you who haven't seen it before, um, and uh, it's, it's quite, uh, it's a nice little piece of kit, um, and that's what our, the students were using with me today, so we were having a lot of fun on that. Um, the other one was uh, Zooniverse, I'll just pull that one up as well. Uh, Um, and this, this one's a bit broader than just astronomy. It started out with a, a galaxy categorization. Um, so Galaxy Zoo was the first one. And now they've got a lot of um, other ones, you know, so how do stars, you know, gravitational lensing. They've still got a lot of good astronomy ones, but then they've got other ones on climate, humanities, <coughs> nature, and biology as well. So there's like genetic, you know, they can do protein folding to help uh, find cures for cancer, um, all, all these kind of things. And, and you know, these capture, um, I, I think one of the big aha moments for me was when my own daughter was beavering away on a laptop and the grandparents were staying with us and Pappy came over and said, you know, what are you doing? And she said, oh, you know, I'm just doing um, knee replacement surgery. <laughs> because she got bored with hip replacement surgery <laughs> on Ed Heads. I, I think it was a site called Ed Heads. I think, Roland, you'd know that one. Um, yes. And, uh, you know, there's a virtual surgery unit in there and you can do all these funny stuff. And, you know, her knowledge of, um, of science and, and uh, you know, stuff is just extraordinary. Uh, and and you, you talk to teenage kids and, and they, they love... My middle daughter, she loves um, cells and biology and stuff like that. But you know, we sat down and had a conversation. And she said, "What? Well, you know, you're going to do that at university as well." I don't really understand what a job in that looks like. You know, I, I don't know. You know, I really like cells, but I don't know what you do with cells. <laughs> you know, to raise a family and have a career. So. Mm -hmm. It was kind of, and that, that was a bit of an interesting moment for me as a parent because I, I looked at saying, well, well, how do, how do you create the link? You know, how, how do you actually um, get them to a point where they can actually identify um, with, um, um, you know, a career path for, for some of these things? So, so in terms of, um, uh, and I, I used an example for her. I said, well, look, you're really good at art and design. And you love cells, right? So what, what might that look like in the future? And, you know, we, we're seeing now where 3D printers in 10 years from now, they're hoping that they'll be able to print kidneys with stem cells from, you know, a host to actually create a kidney replacement. Um, and that will involve knowledge of cells and how they work, but it will also not involve knowledge of CAD and design and artistic sort of flair in, in building those kind of things. So I said to her, I said, well, you know, you love cells, you're good at art, but 
out there in the future is a job that's going to bring those two things together that hasn't even been invented yet. Mm. Right? So, and I think when you have conversations like that, for, for me, you know, when I went to school, you know, I thought, oh, I'd love to be an astronomer, but, but I'm no good at maths, and there's only one astronomer in the country, you know. And a, as a teenager, it's sort of, you know, I took a very different path to get back to where I am now today. Uh, so it was quite um, different, you know, the corporate route, and then coming back as a as an amateur astronomer, helping the professionals, sort of, rather than being the, you know, the the university geek for ten years to, you know. To do that, um, so you know, I think these are the conversations we have. You know, how do we engage people in science with the hearts and minds at the level they're at, where where the, the, they're starting to think about their future, and, and helping them paint a picture that one, this is fun; two, it can actually be used for real stuff; and three, here's some um, projects you can get involved in right now that can help you develop your own knowledge and passion in the area. So. I guess for me that that's you know my approach to it, but I'll be happy to hear from anyone else who's uh, got different approaches. Oh, thank you very much, mate. Um, what I might do, I'm just conscious of the time here, and I just might just um, do a bit of a wrap and put together some of our ideas, mate. Um, yeah. I'd like to do it traditionally, starting from left to right. But just looking at tonight, I might start from right to left. So perhaps just some closing thoughts, um, starting with uh, Ziad. Okay, I was really, really fascinated by tonight. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, you know, it's it's great work that you're doing with the schools that uh, you're getting involved with. Um, I've certainly been taking notes um, as I've been listening, and I'm definitely going to be sharing them with the science department at my school. Um, this sort of stuff is just really, really good, and actually um, is giving me ideas about you know getting people outside people involved, um, even within my own area, uh, which is not science, but um, still, well, I mean, it is a, a manner of science, but it's not the same. It's not the physical sciences. Um, still, yeah, thank you very much. Peter, thank I mean, ever since we sat around the campfire, the Stone Age campfire, <laughs> you know, we would gaze at our worlds from the ground up. I mean, we're looking for patterns in space. It was a chance to ask questions about our place in time and space. And it was great for us to expand our minds and perspectives. And I often think that's where some of these different renaissances and science kind of happens is around those campfires looking up. Mm. What you've reminded me tonight is the challenges that we face when we teach difficult concepts that we need to really carefully scaffold the learning. And it's mm. easy to ignore this and we end up dumbing down really powerful ideas that should be understood. Um, I mean, imagine teaching about planets but avoiding mentioning gravity orbits or the speed of light. I mean, it just turns it into a sort of like a, an alphabet soup. You've also reminded me that teachers don't need to be astronomy experts you know, to get this work in the classroom. I mean, they can bring amateur professionals like you into their classroom, and that's exciting. I mean, that's real-world stuff. I mean, tonight you shared your love of big ideas and big numbers. And I owe you a big thank you for coming along tonight. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Oh, you're most welcome. Thanks. I've enjoyed the um, the Excel and um, Hangout, and I've been learning a lot from you guys. And and uh, as, as we've learned how to use Google Plus just as a tool, you know, it's it's been great. So thanks for having me as a guest. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. And Jason. Well, thanks, Peter. Getting kids interested in space science and astronomy is a great introduction to science. But a lot needs to be done to support teachers, particularly in primary, to foster this passion in students. Astronomical societies, NASA and other organizations can be a great support network, particularly in the projects they sponsor. But mm. as with the projects you've been sort of doing, even just taking kids out with a small telescope for an astronomy night or making their own simple telescopes or making moon observations over a month and drawing them can be great stepping stones to more adventurous projects such as making radio telescopes, um, controlling remote telescopes, launching rockets and all the other fun things. And in particular with our own sort of inter um, area for ACCELN, um, linking in with digital technologies as more and more astronomy now is done with um, data crunching and analysis and remotely controlling telescopes and robotic explorers and even the concept of the interplanetary internet and the ways of communicating throughout 
a larger network beyond that we have here on Earth. So thanks very much for giving us an insight into some of the great things happening in the world of astronomy and how it's linking in with what's happening in education. Hmm. And next week we're going to um, have Karen Swift who will be talking about um, the ACCE 2014 study tour. Karen's taken study tours to the United States for the last um, three years now I think and it's a great experience to come, go along and attend a large international conference and visit lots of interesting locations and schools including Google and Apple and various other headquarters of the major corporations. So remember you can check the ACCE LN homepage for more information in the coming days and if you'd like to join the panel let Roland and Amanda know and if you want to view past hangout recordings you can go to http dot dot forward slash forward slash acceln dot wikispaces dot com and we look forward to seeing you then thank you to my guests and tonight to Peter goodbye everyone okay. good night good night